Hi everyone, Brian here. Um, I'm sitting here fanning myself because I'm a bit warm. I have just done uh, a rather intense workout and had a very hot shower and as a consequence I have, as they would say in polite company, got a bit of a dab on. If I was in impolite company then I might say something like I'm sweating like a glass blower's arse but um, I wouldn't be so crude to you guys. So um, yeah, I'm a bit warm so um, allow me to just fan myself until I cool down a little bit and uh, I just wanted to pop on really because, um, well, this is the first video I have done since I returned from the UK Tarot Conference last weekend, this weekend just gone, and this coming weekend I'm going to um, another event, another three day training actually, uh, it's the first weekend of my Enneagram course which I've spoken about a bit on this channel already so I'm very excited about that, um, but consequently it's meant that this week has been a bit of a blur, it's been a kind of, you know, get back from London, get back to work, the day job, have a pretty busy uh, week actually this week and pretty full on intense week this week in the day job and then go off and do um, this Enneagram course. So I wasn't sure that I'd actually managed to do a video but I just couldn't really let the week pass without uh, popping on to say hello to you all. Um, and also I wanted to say a little bit more about magic because I have had such a great response to my first magic video uh, which was really just a, um, an opening gambit in terms of I think I might do this series on magic and here's some thoughts and so on and wow the response has just been amazing. So many of you clearly uh, are up for this conversation which is just fantastic and I'm, I'm up for it too and I can't wait to learn more from you uh, about the topic of magic. So. Um, I want to say something briefly about magic in this video, um, but I also just wanted to say a little bit to you about the Tarot Conference itself. Um, it was absolutely brilliant, the UK Tarot Conference. If you have not been to it, then um, and you're interested in going to it in future years, then I strongly recommend that you get, to, get yourself to Facebook, look up the UK Tarot Conference Facebook group, and join it and you'll see photos from the event there and you can connect with the uh, organiser Kim, Kim Arnold who did a fantastic job of organising the conference and you can connect with other people who've been there and who are planning to go next year. Um, if anyone watching this by the way is has been thinking about going or is thinking about going but is a bit nervous about going and, and sort of worried perhaps if they're on their own or just and are just not sure if um, it'll be for them, I can reassure you that the people there are the friendliest bunch of people you could hope to meet. You will not be on your on your own for long. Um, as it was, I had the privilege of bumping into several people I did know. Some of people, some people I'd met before, uh, and some people I hadn't met. I was sitting at um, a table in the conference, and um, there, there was uh, somebody who was sitting opposite me, and and she and I were kind of. I could tell that we were kind of looking at each other as though we do. We do I know that person? Does she know me? Do I know her? Um, and anyway, it was Elizabeth Harkin, uh, who has her own YouTube, YouTube channel, and um, it was just great to catch up with her and uh, uh, to finally meet in person, having connected on YouTube before now. Um, and I sat beside Gavin, who is a member of um, my Tower to the Nines group, and who I'd met through um, another event briefly, uh, the Tabby event earlier in the year, and Pammy, who is also part of Tower to the Nines, uh, was uh, at the event as well. She was at my table and the three of us kind of uh, acted as a little trio doing read readings for each other and reflecting on our readings. It was just great and I met up with Louise um, Underhill of Priestess Tarot, who lives not very far from me, um, and Mary Collin. Uh, I met the speakers, of course. I met Benabel Wen and did a walkthrough of her deck, Spirit Keepers Tarot, um, and attended her uh, three of her uh, sessions actually, she did two sessions in the main conference and one uh, the night before and the one that she did the night before was about the tarot and the I Ching and also um, that brought some magical uh, elements into it as did her, <coughs> excuse me, her tarot and catabasis or catabasis, I don't, I'm not quite sure how you say that um, presentation which was just mind-blowing and um, she, it was funny she said to me um, after the, the presentation that she did on the Thursday night uh, which was thrilling, but kind of boggled my mind, which was looking at the I Ching hexagrams and their relationship to tarot and to various scientific theories. Uh, and she said, oh, you know, feel free to use some of that material for your magic series. And I was thinking, you know, I will need, if I, if I was going to do that, I need to sit down and really study it to get my head around it. Um, but perhaps we'll come back and touch on that at some point, because it was just... Um, fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I met Rachel Pollack, of course, who was there, and... Um, 
Caitlin Matthews, who I, 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 or Kathleen Matthews, who I've met before, and Silla Conway gave a presentation, Joe Watkins, um, Tiro Heinian, um, I think that's how you say his surname, sorry Tiro if I've completely mangled that, um, gave a very uh, funny and interesting presentation on the history of the Tarot Devil. So it was just, it was just a great, great, great event. It was great fun, it was well paced, it was really enjoyable. Uh, highly recommended so um if you get the chance to go do go oh and there was a competition to design your own devil card the theme of the weekend uh, of, of the conference was the devil because they're doing it um year on year and this was the 15th year so next year of course will be the tower that'll be exciting and uh we had, had a competition to um design our own devil card i didn't win there was a very worthy winner i can't um remember now the name of the person who won but but she did a, a really good um devil card but I'm quite pleased with mine uh, this was just kind of a very rough draft I did it very quickly um, but yeah I, I'm, I'm quite I quite like it I called it the disowned I'm not going to explain it to you I'm just gonna let you take from it what you want to take from it um, but it turned out fairly well it kind of kind of said what I wanted it to say so um, there was all kinds of creative things like that that you could do, and there were stalls, of course, so there were things that one could buy if one wanted to. I was quite good, actually, and managed to resist the temptation to buy um, very much at all. So, um, so that was good. That was good. What else can I tell you? Um, oh, by the way, look, this is not Maya, in case you were wondering. This is not Maya, but look what I got today from my local supermarket. How cool is that? It is a black tinsel Maya. Well, it's a black tinsel cat, but I'm, I've decided it's a black tinsel Maya, even though she doesn't have pink ears. Um, but she has got a little Halloween witch's hat, not dissimilar to this, which I will have to dig out soon. And perhaps she will grace us with her presence between now and Halloween, or maybe even on Halloween with her little hat. But in case she doesn't, this little black tinsel cat will um, will have to do. So, uh, can I say where I got it from? Is it am I allowed to, or is that advertised? Should I ask for a commission? It's from a well-known local supermarket. It starts with S and ends in Ainsbury's. Um, but I'm sure that other well-known local supermarkets have similar Halloween decorations. But not as cool as this. Anyway, so that's my little Halloween cat, which I'm thrilled by. Maya is just completely disinterested in the cat. She just showed complete disinterest. I showed it to her thinking either she's going to love it or attack it. But she did neither. She just kind of looked at it and wandered off. So that was, that was Maya for you. So, magic. Hmm. What can I tell you about magic? So, oh, actually, let's just do our yogi, yogi tea divination before we begin. Ah, this could not be more appropriate. Love is an elevated self. Love is an elevated self. That's a little um, slogan on my yogi tea today. And that fits very well with what I want to say to you about magic. Because one of the things that I did in my last video was I riffed a bit on the subject of magic and I talked about various definitions of magic and I gave um, a kind of a garbled account of my own definition of magic. So um, since that video, <clears throat> since I've been away, I have been thinking about that definition of magic and um, thinking I needed to refine it somewhat. So I have I have done that. I have come up with a, a, a kind of more, um, I hope, more articulate uh, iteration of what my view of magic is. So this is what I've got, and I reserve the right to change this. But at the moment, this is this is kind of what um, my magical approach is about. Uh, I've defined magic as the art and craft of using will and imaginative practice to bring consciousness and reality into empowering equanimity. What the hell? Let me say it again. I know it's a long sentence and it's probably too long, but it does kind of say what I wanted to say, so I'll, I'll just say it again. Magic, my kind of magic, is the art and craft of using will and imaginative practice to bring reality, to bring, sorry, I've garbled it already. Let me start again. Magic, my kind of magic. Magic is the art and craft of using will and imaginative practice to bring consciousness and reality into empowering equanimity. What do I mean by that? So, um, I spoke in the last video about the fact that different definitions of magic uh, 
say similar things but have slightly different emphases and the emphases tend to fall on whether you are using magic whatever magic is the practice of magic to shift real world things material world things to, to change the circumstances of your life the physical structures of your world or to change your mind about those things and to change your consciousness so that your world changes so those are the two broad camps change the outside world or change the inside world and um where i've got to is recognizing that magic doesn't have to be either or uh, and a working definition of magic can allow for both because there are times when quite frankly all you want to do is focus on achieving um some kind of change in your world you know maybe you you're in a job that you hate maybe you are in um a relationship that you that is not healthy maybe you are not in a relationship and you want to be in one maybe um you're dealing with a health issue that is manageable but you're not managing it very well and you want to manage it better so um you know there are there are times when it is possible very possible but not always easy to make changes in the circumstances of our reality um, the real world circumstances um, and so magic can be about that a magical practice where we set our intention where we uh, employ our imaginative faculties where we construct some kind of uh, ritual practice perhaps or some kind of spell work uh, which focuses our mind and focuses our, our intention and allows us to open up to new things coming into our life so that we can make use of those things and start to transform reality it, sometimes in um, very rational obvious normal ways and sometimes in seemingly irrational um, more intuitive ways but nonetheless ways that you know where the world apparently changes um, so there are times when magic can be can and should be focused on achieving that kind of real world change um, but there are other times when the truth of the matter is your real world circumstances may not be changeable maybe not in the way that you want them to be so um, you know maybe we're in a position where our job disappears because the organization we're in goes bankrupt you know you can wish and you can wish and you can wish and you can magic and you can magic and you can magic and you know, it is unlikely that that is going to change just on the basis of your willing it. Um, even more harshly, if, I don't know, maybe somebody we love dies. You know, magic is not going to, it's not going to resurrect them from the dead. So magic can only do the things that are possible in the natural course of things, which is one of the, one of the things about magic that I think makes people balk at it when they start hearing people talking about magic like you, you, you seriously believe in magic what they're really saying is do you seriously believe in the version of magic that I think magic means um, because very often what people think magic is about is unnatural things um, Harry Potter style magic where you can transform into a cat you know like Professor McGonagall does and of course that's not what magic is about not real world magic. Mag real magic is, um, depending on your definition, and in, in terms of my definition, is about using your will and your imaginative practice to bring your consciousness and reality into coherent, coherence um, and into um, empowering equanimity. So what do I mean by empowering equanimity? I mean balance. I mean sometimes we need to shift our outside world and make the circumstances of our life different because they're not serving us um, and we just we need to improve them and we can use our magical practice to help us do that and you know in the case of for example changing your job you know by all means do some spell work do some candle magic you know make a sigil um, do some kind of ritual that that is focused on helping you shift your employment prospects but also apply for jobs you know go to interviews look in the papers and online for new jobs don't sit at home in your magic circle magic 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 and expect a job to just materialize out of thin air that is not going to happen um so there's that kind of magic where you are using this practice to support your real world efforts at change that's one side of the equation 
And the other side of the equation for me, of course, is um, the, uh, the changing your consciousness thing, um, where, again, to take the example of you've lost your job, nobody likes to lose their job, um, but either you can be in a position where you are sitting at home feeling terrible about that, about that, and that might be a natural reaction to have at first, of course, and you can also be in a position where you are focusing your mind on where are the benefits here? What does this free me up to do? How can I make the most of the situation? Um, and that is not always easy. And there are some circumstances where it would be unkind to suggest that somebody moves to that very quickly. So again, going back to the idea of, you know, somebody um, loses somebody close to them. You know, it's not... Uh, magically sensible to say, you know what, I'm not going to bother grieving, I'm just going to do a magic spell to change my consciousness so that I'm happy with the fact that this person is no longer with me. You know, that's not likely, is it? It's more likely that that magic would be something you would use to support your grieving process, to allow yourself to come to terms with what's happening, to use magical practice to acknowledge the person's presence in your life and the fact that they are now absent, um, apparently absent in the physical sense. Um, so again, it's about kindness, it's about equanimity, it's not about being unrealistic. And um, so, so those are the two sides of the equation, either we can work to change our external world, and if we're going to do that, and we're going to use magic to do that, do the practical stuff first, because, you know, magic helps those who help themselves is one way of putting it. And then the other way is to say, sometimes we are dealing with circumstances that we are never in a million years going to change immediately in the physical real world sense. So what can we do from here and what can we do from here? Because for me, the point of magic, um, the point of a magical practice is to, um, I want to live a, a life where I am as present as possible and as loving as possible in every minute of my life to myself towards others that's what I want and I'm not saying that's where I'm at I'm not saying that's where I've got to I'm just saying that's what I want and um, for me that's what my magical practice is about and sometimes that's about working magic to help me change the circumstances of my life and sometimes it's about working magic to help me change my perspective on life and how do you decide which one to use well you need to employ discernment you need to you need to figure out what is the appropriate thing to do is it appropriate to um, be accepting of what's happening externally uh, I will I'll use the term external real world and internal um, consciousness uh, just as uh, representations of those two different states but but you know, if I'm honest in my philosophy, the two are not divided. I spoke in the last video about this non-dual um, approach, this kind of Taoist approach of um, all is one. We are all one thing, but we are apparently separate things. And I've got something to read to you on that in a second. Um, but my mindset is, and again, I'm not saying that I'm in this this space of um, perception but my mindset is to try and remember that whilst things seem separate and seem divided they are actually part of one thing happening and therefore magic is uh, an acknowledgement of that an acknowledgement of that oneness and that connectedness and that allows us then to recognize that when we apply magic what we're really doing is applying a process that allows us to become more conscious of that oneness, that wholeness. Um, so, um, so for me magic is also about being real. We sometimes hear about the phrase magical thinking, it's sometimes used in a very disparaging way. Um, it's used to mean somebody being unrealistic, having unrealistic expectations. And of course it's certainly possible to have um, what you might call uh, wasteful, wishful wishful thinking. So in other words, wishful thinking for things that are never going to happen. But then it's also possible to have constructive wishful thinking, where we allow ourselves to figure out what it is we wish for, <coughs> to, uh, 
to discern what's possible in that wish, i.e. is it possible to change the outside circumstances or is that not possible, but is it, it's always possible, um, I think, to change our internal circumstances. So um, it can be about thinking about that, being real about that, and then applying this empowering, imaginative, you know, choosing willfully to do what we need to do and then employing our empowering um, imaginative practice um, to achieve what we need to achieve in a magical sense. Um, also for me, magic is not any prescribed model. You know, so, uh, you know, I don't care whether you know, you're talking about um, the magic that Alistair Crowley would have purported or the magic that comes from the, you know, sort of grim, ancient grimoires or the magic that Dion Fortune would do or other ceremonial magicians would do or Wiccan magic that you might find, um, you know, in your Gerald Gardner or Doreen Valiente doing or chaos magic or any, any form of magic. It doesn't matter what kind of magic it is. Um, None of that is the only kind of magic and the right kind of magic and the best kind of magic. It's all just different complexions of magic that different people found their way to. And for me, part of this, this process that I've been on and the process that this, this video series is about is about us finding our own way to our own magical practice. Um, because magic is not should not be about dogma. That's one of the principles of chaos magic, you know, not being dogmatic. But any form of magic, including chaos magic, can become dogmatic if we let it become dogmatic. If we start thinking it's got to be like this or that's better than that. That's, that's not how I see it. Um, and so for me, my kind of magic involved all kinds of different practices from all different disciplines. And in fact, one of the, the disciplines that I um, have often thought about as being a kind of magical practice, although others would say it's a bit like cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy or a kind of Buddhist meditation, is a practice I've spoken about before on this channel and that is the practice of the work of Byron Katie, which is about um, questioning stressful thoughts. Because what I've observed, I, I did the school for the work with Katie a few years ago um, and learned how to do the work uh, rather intensively. And really what I noticed there was um, both with people I worked with and myself when I applied the work to my own circumstances, was that although it was about questioning our thoughts and our judgments and shifting our inter internal world as a result, not by saying I'm going to shift it, by simply questioning what was there and then noticing that sh things shifted, that was internal work, but almost inevitably what happened was external things changed. You know, external reality apparently changed. And of course, it changed because our perception of it changed. Um, but sometimes that changed perception changed the way that we acted in the world and that resulted in changes in the way that the world acted towards us. That's, that's um, how to put it um, broadly. So I guess to summarise, apart from my magical definition, the other thing I would say is magic is a mindset. And um, if you come into magic with the mindset that it is possible to bring all these tools to bear, to achieve, in my definition, the art and craft of using will and imaginative practice to bring consciousness and reality into empowering equanimity, then my goodness, what power there is in that, what potential there is in that, what possibilities there are in that, the possibility of being present, the possibility of being loving, the possibility of seeing where in our lives things are not working and are not connecting and are not working for us and applying various tools, some of which are logical and rational tools, but some of which are imaginative and artistic and free-flowing and non-rational, apparently, applying those tools um, in a way that can be very constructive. That, to me, is what my kind of magic is about. So I want to... Um, I want to finish by, I said I was going to read you a couple of things, and actually I'm going to read from you a bit from uh, this book, A Mind at Home with Itself by Byron Katie. And um, the reason I'm reading this bit is I actually shared some of this with Becca Taro Night Owl, because she, one of her videos, prompted me to share this, and, and so I thought I would share it with all of you as well. So there's two quotes here. Uh, the first one is from the first chapter in the book called The Cosmic Joke. And I should say that this book... Um, 
is probably the most full-on book of Byron Katie. So she speaks from a position of having had a very profound awakening ex experience, which she then used to develop this tool called the work, this process called the work. <clears throat> and her first um, mainstream book, Loving What Is, goes into the process in a lot of detail and has lots of examples and, does, and says a little bit about her life, her experience of living from that place. This book um, kind of retells the story of her experience and goes into in much more detail what it's actually like to live from that enlightened frame of mind. And the way that it's been constructed is um, that they, she and her husband, who co-wrote the book with her, have taken uh, segments of the Diamond Sutra, uh, which is the Buddhist text, and uh, put in a little segment, and then Katie writes about that segment and what it means from her perspective. So um, this is from the first chapter, The Cosmic Joke, and um, and I'll read you the bit from the Diamond Sutra and then go into what she said, a bit of what she says. So the Diamond Sutra quote is as follows. Thus have I heard the Buddha was once staying in Shravasti at Anathapindika's garden in the Jetta Grove with a community of 1250 monks. Early in the morning when the mealtime came, he put on his robe, took his bowl and walked into the city to beg for his food, going from house to house. When he'd finished, he returned to the garden and took his meal. Then he put away his robe and bowl, washed his feet, and sat down. The Buddha being very ordinary. So, here's what Byron Katie writes. I come from a little desert town in Southern California where people think that the Buddha is the happy fat guy whose statue you see in Chinese restaurants. It wasn't until I met Stephen, my husband, that I learned that the fat guy is actually Pu Tai, the Chinese god of prosperity. The Buddha is the thin one, he told me, the one with the serene smile on his face. I respect what Stephen says, but for me, the guy with the big belly is the Buddha too. He's the one who gets the joke. The joke is that it's all a dream, all of life, everything. Nothing ever is, nothing ever can be, since the very instant it seems to be, it's gone. This is truly hilarious. Anyone who gets the joke has the right to laugh, that wonderful, whole body, belly shaking laugh. Here's another way of saying it. To me, the word Buddha, the word Buddha means pure generosity, meticulous, joyful generosity, without left or right or up or down or possible or impossible. The generosity that naturally flows out of you when you're awake to what is real. Generosity is what's left of you after you realize that there's no such thing as a self there's nothing to know, and there's no one to know it. So how do I know this? What fun. So that's um, from one chapter. And then a bit later on in the book, um, she is writing in a chapter called Mind is Everything, Mind is Good. Um, and she goes on to riff on this idea of there not being a self, not being a separate self, only being an apparent separate self, but really all selves being part of the one. It's true that there is no self and no other. It's true that there is no truth and no non-truth. There are no separate things and there are no non-separate things. There is no world outside you and also no world inside you because until you believe there's a you, you haven't created a world. If you believe there's a world, you have two, you and the world. And if you believe there's no world outside yourself, you still have two. But there aren't two. Two is a creation of the confused mind. There's only one, and not even that. No world, no self, no substance. Only awareness without a name. We'll come back to this book, I think, later in the series. And um, to finish, I thought what I would do is draw for you um, from two decks. And uh, the last magic video I did, I drew from the very lovely uh, Enchanted Spell Oracle. And from in this video, I'd like to draw for you from another um, deck that is, is a deck of spell cards, effectively, and that is Magical Spell Cards. And this is a deck that I had been aware of for a while and had my eye on. And then I saw um, Becca uh, from Becca Tarot Night Owl um, 
uh, used these cards and just thought, yeah, I'd like to get my hands on those, and I have, and I have not regretted it. They're lovely cards, and each card has on it a spell. So I'm going to pull for you a card, and you know, your homework, should you choose to accept it, is to carry out this spell in whatever way you think is appropriate, if it's appropriate for you. So we're shuffling, we're shuffling, we're shuffling, and we're going to cut. And our spell is <clears throat> organization. That is the spell. Purpose, planning, efficiency. Now come to me so easily. That's the affirmation. There is the, um, the lovely card. So let me read to you what it says. Card number 42. Let me have another sip of tea. Cheers, everyone. Organisation. Organisation doesn't sound particularly magical, does it? But without a practical foundation or structure, we can be chaotic and spend our energy where it is not needed. This spell will calm the erratic, scattered quality we can all sometimes have and thus help us to make the very most of our personal magic and of the time and energy we have. Organisation is a kind of freedom that allows us to be direct and clear in our work, gifting us time and energy to spend on play. If this card shows you, the universe is asking you to begin to learn about the liberation you can reach through to structure your time uh, and be very clear in your approach to spending your energy. You will waste less and do more with what remains. When we are organised, it clears space and time for the spirit to sing through. And then... So when, when she says, it's from this is Lucy Cavendish's deck, by the way, and when she says, if the card chose you, that's if you selected it, as I did there, through a um, random method. But if you're going through the deck and you're picking it, she's also got a section on what, what, how to apply this if you're choosing it. So if you chose this spell, be prepared to begin to work on your own space and the ways in which you work. You will clear clutter, reorganise your working space, and begin to streamline how you work to create ample, fluid systems that open up opportunities. The material and the divine can form an alliance when we are organised. Your dreams can begin to find room and take shape and your power will flow from strength to strength. So here is the organisation spell. This spell is best cast on a Wednesday, though any day is suitable, from the new through to the full moon. It's a beautiful full moon the last couple of nights. You will need paper, pen, a candle, sandalwood oil and sweet orange oil. Go to your sacred space and see a circle of white light all around you. When you can feel the circle strong and glowing, pop three drops of sandalwood oil and one drop of orange oil into your hands. Rub your hands together gently, warming the oil, and then roll the candle between your hands. Light the candle and chant the following three times. I call upon the goddess and god to help me bring... to help... sorry. I call upon the goddess and god to help me break through habits of old. I begin now to rebuild a purpose, framework, in which my skills can reach potential, be fulfilled, clarity order I now require to bring about my desires. Purpose planning efficiency now come to me easily, and by the power of three times three, as I do will, so mote it be. Take your pen and paper and begin to write a list of what you need to do. Include big long-term projects and short-term must-do-today projects. On another sheet of paper, organise these projects into groups of big picture, long-term dreams. What must be done soon and what must be done this week. Once this is done, blow out your candle and send a wish for organisation and the freedom and clarity it can bring out into the universe. Close your circle, seeing it shimmer and merge back into the great universe from which it emerged and know the energy you have invested this day will return to you to the power of three. Make a commitment to move through your list over the next seven days, remembering the wonderful feeling you have with when each item is ticked off. Be sure to take steps to complete tasks each and every day and really build the momentum. Work with dedication and motivation will follow. Blessed be, brilliant one. Isn't that lovely? So that's your spell. And I've got one other little gift for you, and that is because I'm very excited. I got these cards, uh, they just arrived today, and I haven't even tried them, and they are the Untethered Soul cards. I'll probably at some point will do a review of this deck. 
Um, but before I do a review, let's just, I haven't even, you know, shuffled through the cards, so I'm not even sure what the structure is. Um, so I'm actually, just, rather than disorder them, I'm actually just going to cut them and we'll see what we get. So, there we are. Okay, I've got two cards. I'm, I didn't know whether I was taking the bottom card or the top card, so we're going to take two. So they're both from the section called Freeing Yourself. I don't know if you can see that in the back, Freeing Yourself. So one of them is let go. No matter what it is, let go. And the other, when a blockage gets hit, it's a good thing. It's time to open up internally and release the blocked energy. So, to summarize, magic is a mindset. I've developed my definition of magic and I invite you to develop yours. The task, should you choose to accept it, is to organize. Organize yourself, organize your mind, organize your magical practice. And free yourself. Be prepared to let go of the blockages you may encounter, even as they arise. That is magic. I will see you all again very soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.